SJC 12351, Commonwealth v. A Juvenile. Mr. Majikuma, good afternoon. May it please the court, Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, Attorney Joseph Majakamo on behalf of LNA Juvenile. <clears throat> uh, first off, thank you for uh, bumping this case one week. It um, would have been hard pressed to have argued this last week. This court today is <coughs> tasked with a Herculean task and that is whether to interpret section 23 uh, with a sword or with a shield. And in the end, I am hopeful that this court will follow our sister states of Vermont, Ohio, excuse me, I forgot my glasses, Pennsylvania, in Florida, in finding that statutory rape statute as applied to the individuals it is supposed to protect is unconstitutional. With well reference to Section 23 and equal protection, I would argue to the court that it's unconstitutional as applied in this case. As the court is well aware, these were two juveniles of tender years who engaged in what I believe the record reflects is consensual experimental behavior. Now, I have to applaud my sister having done death penalty in the South in attempting to change the picture, uh, inciting things pursuant to school grades and how they differentiate buildings and things of that sort, and also uh, pointing out the fact that the younger of the two juveniles was scared, uh, among other things. But I think a correct reading of the entire transcript shows that these were two individuals who were engaging in normal play at times. And at some point in time, the older of the juveniles um, suggested to the younger that they engage in the sexual experimentation. Uh, although the younger juvenile does testify that he was scared and it hurt and things of that sort, I would point out that the transcript is clear that the juvenile engaged in it voluntarily because he was tired of the other individual. But, but you're, you're not asking us to make factual findings. No, I'm not, the, Judge. The jury, just... the jury had the opportunity to convict on forcible rape, and they did not convict on that ground. Uh, do, we need to, do we need to suggest that this was benign, or is it enough simply to say that he was not convicted on that ground of it being forcible? I, I believe it's enough to say he was not convicted on that. That being said, I'm simply erring on the side of caution um, here. So uh, um, we, we've, we've held numerous times that uh, statutory uh, rape laws don't violate due process. Um, we had an opinion um, last year, Justice Gaziano talking about uh, 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 there's no uh, prohibition on strict liability um, offenses and it's the role of the legislature to, um, to uh, define crimes. So why isn't this a um, very important issue, a legislative issue? Judge, uh, my sister raised that, that it basically it was out of the purview of this court to entertain this, and I would respectfully disagree with that. Uh, this court and the appeals court is tasked with interpreting the legislative intent and constitutional principles. And while I would agree with you that there are some statutory, uh, there are some strict liability statutes that are constitutional, and in fact, I would, I would suggest that the underlying legislative intent of this statute when applied to individuals over the statutory age uh, preying on individuals <coughs> under the statutory age uh, may very well be constitutional. Although Massachusetts lacks a Romeo and Juliet clause at this time, uh, although the legislature seems to be working towards that uh, 
I disagree with their last category, but uh, I would suggest here, Your Honor, that uh, there is a due process violation because these two individuals were equally situated. These two individuals both engaged in acts on each other and only one was prosecuted. I would suggest that that amounts to a violation of the equal protection judge. Council, looking at the statute and the history of the statute and how it evolved over in 1966, I think they changed the law to bring it, uh, make it, make it more modern. But it still retains the word abuses. Does that? I haven't been able to find anything that defines that or or mentions that this seems to be a superfluous word in the statute. You know, Your Honor, I spent two days in the law library trying to research the uh, legislative intent and historical aspects of this. Uh, and it's in Massachusetts, it's extremely difficult to do that, uh, uh, which hopefully someday that will change and the legislature will take note of that. Uh, but I, I would agree with you that th there is no real definition of abuse and up and above that, the statute says whoever, and that is problematic when you are talking about two individuals who are under the statutory age of 16. Um, and I believe the legislature is starting, although albeit uh, late, is starting to recognize that, that there is a problem with this statute as applied to individuals under 16 or in certain other cases, uh, an individual who may be 16 and 17 and one who may but, be 15 or 16. Help, that doesn't help your argument. That goes to what Justice Lowy was saying, that it's a legislative um, um, separation of powers issue. Where, again, is the due process equal protection violation? Well, Judge, I would respectfully disagree. I think you still have, under this, as, under this statute, you have the ability to interpret the legislative instead. Um, I believe in, with reference to this case. But you're saying that the, the words of the statute can be interpreted to prohibit peer aged um, statutory rape liability? At this time, yes. And I think but what it, words of the statute give you that? Whoever engages okay. the word, whoever, who, means whoever or whomever, if my recollection is correct. And I'd actually have to take a quick look at one of the amicus briefs who um, who's extensively discusses that. With reference to the equal... I'm sorry, I lost you. How does whoever mean only those over 16? Please, I'm sorry? How does ho however mean only those over 16? I don't believe it does. I think it incorporates everybody. So you're saying that the statute incorporates everybody, including... including the juveniles, who, people, two individuals who are under 16. Okay. Now, there is this... Going back to Justice... Uh, Going back to Justice Cipher's question, the phrase, and abuses a child, we generally give meaning to all the language of a statute. What meaning do you suggest we should give to that phrase? Or what meaning, more importantly, do you think the legislature intended to give to that phrase? That's an easy question, Your Honor, but a hard question. I, I, I believe it was the legislature's intent there in defining abuse in the context of an older individual having sexual relations with another. I mean, the definition of abuse in and of itself can run the gambit uh, uh, from mere spanking or, or corporal punishment, something to that effect, to, to psychological. Uh, here, I, I firmly believe that the underlying history of the statute and the legislative intent of the statute, they meant abuse to mean having some sort of sexual relationship with an individual under 16, that that would be abuse. Uh, would it constitute physical abuse? I guess that would, um, that would be an open question for the court. Would it constitute mental abuse? Could, could Get, another child abuse a child? That's a, you know, Justice Asiano, that's a hard question as we see. Um, well, what is the 15-year-old and the 3-year-old? 
that 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 is what I was getting at, Your Honor. That is a hard question. When we you know, is that a hard question? A fifteen and a three-year-old, no. But I don't think you can subscribe hard numbers to this. Is a as society seems to be progressing, although I don't uh, look forward to it with a daughter uh, who's going to be in her teens. Uh, did society at one point believe that a, a 17 year old and a 15 year old, uh, would that constitute abuse? Does society believe that now? Uh, you know, the United States Supreme Court has said that the law is always evolving uh, to give a definition of abuse. It really, it's going to be age dependent, which runs so into. Your, in your view, then. You can never have a, an underage victim if the person who is in, uh, initiating the, the contact is also underage? The courts that have addressed this have seemed to have come to that conclusion at this stage, uh, i.e. Vermont, Ohio, uh, Florida, Pennsylvania, do I personally, I, you know, if you have a 14-year-old who, who engages in uh, some sort of sexual relationship with a 7-year-old or, or a 6-year-old, it's problematic. I think the, the, it's, the legislature really has to work at defining what the current acceptable norms are in society. Isn't that, isn't that last point you made just the point that the legislature has to deal with these normative values? Well, yeah, yes, Your Honor, but that... Context that, of Article 30? But that has nothing to do with the underlying case now and whether that is uh, something for the legislature to do with reference to what they are currently proposing. Uh, as it's written now in its form, I, I believe that Again, it makes illegal any consensual. Uh, I'm just trying to understand, what is the Constitution? Is it because it's overly broad? I'm, I'm just not sure what you're... I, a, I your, believe there's a, there's an, it's overly broad. I believe there's a funda fundamental fairness issue. I also believe that there's a constitutional issue with reference to giving uh, law enforcement the ability to basically... <clears throat> Uh, promote arbitrary and uh, discriminatory, discriminatory enforcement by assigning or looking at factors that simply are not within the purview of Section 23 as it applies to, to juveniles who are under the age of 16. Uh, in this case, LN was charged uh, simply because he was older. Well, that's an equal protection. Are you making and, that's an equal protection art? Is it, are, which are is also within my brief? Yes. Okay. I just it would be helpful just to you know flesh out at least one of these. So, is your equal protection argument that when an eleven-year-old and a seven-year-old engage in sexual activity, you had to prosecute both of them, um, or you? have violated the Equal Protection Clause? Or what's your argument? I just don't know what it is. Or is it when you, that, or that if you prosecute either of them, it's an Equal Protection Clause? But that, I don't understand how that can be. Well, Your Honor, if you have two similarly situated individuals who are under 16 uh, who engage in, in voluntary sexual relationships, then each child is the offender and the victim, and the distinction breaks down. Excuse me. And I think so, this is so even in Justice Lowy's hypothetical, you have a sixteen a fifteen year old and a three year old, that's gonna be an equal protection violation if you don't prosecute the three year old too? Under the current statute, yes, Your Honor. That that can't be right, can it? It's troubling, mm -hmm. but we're dealing with a, a in what I would term as an archaic statute, Your Honor. I think that's why we have we but, but you're asking us to impose a troubling solution to your problem. In saying you're that for, to you're asking us for one size fits all. And, 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 and when you argue 
that hopefully the legislature fixes this, that's the Article 30 argument that your sister's going to make. I, I, I agree, Your Honor, but I, I don't think that precludes you from saying that it, that uh, precludes you from saying, like the other states, that as applied to juveniles under the specific age, that it's unconstitutional. Then it is up if it opens the floodgates. Unfortunately, it opens the floodgates, and they can't prosecute until such time that the legislature fixes the problem. Uh, but to to simply disregard to simply disregard. Uh, the constitutional problems of this statute because it might open the floodgates, I think, is erroneous. All right, thank you. Ms. Moriarty, good afternoon. Good afternoon. May it please the court, Marina Moriarty on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honors, this is not a case about age-appropriate sexual experimentation. This is not a case where the terms victim and perpetrator are rendered meaningless. This is not a case where the juvenile did not know what he was doing was wrong. This was a case where an eight-year-old was subjected to oral and anal sex by the juvenile who was four years and four grades older. Let me, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. so we're uh, not questioning the prosecutive judgment yeah. here, at least I'm right. not. Uh, right. The question is, under your interpretation of the statute, could you have prosecuted the eight-year-old? For the same crime? Yes, under the terms of the statute, that would have been a legal prosecution. And, and would that have, and to what meaning then do you give to and abuses a child under 16 years of age? Would you have said that the eight year old had abused the 12 year old by committing, by engaging in intercourse? That's the part that I'm confused by. The elements of statutory rape as they stand today are sexual intercourse with a person under the age of 16. So the precedent set forth by this case and the appeals court has just been those simple two elements. So it seems as if the courts have read out the abuse word in the statute as a remnant of this archaic statute that has been um, amended over the years. However, the, the two, the, the, juvenile, the eight year old would have met the two elements of statutory rape. However. So in your, in, 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 you're asking us to interpret the statute in a fashion that could have permitted the conviction of the eight year old? It could have, yes, your honor. However, the legislature in this court relies on prosecutorial discretion. And obviously, in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, which is not unbounded, the um, prosecutor is bound to take into consideration certain factors. The most obvious in this case um, was the age differential. And in any case um, where there's a complaint made to the police or to the prosecutor's office, there's a, a myriad of factors that go into consideration about whether or not to take out charges. And there's a mechanism by which um, this juvenile and all other juveniles can challenge prosecutorial discretion and allege uh, selective prosecution and discrimination, which was not done in this case, but could be done in other cases. And it's the juveniles, it would be the juvenile's burden to present a reasonable inference of impermissible discrimination. And then the Commonwealth would have the opportunity to rebut that. Okay, but, but that discrimination would generally be based on you pursue only homosexual acts as opposed to heterosexual acts. It would not be based on the fact that you chose to prosecute the younger as opposed to the older, or you chose to prosecute one as opposed to the other, unless it was based on gender or race or some other forbidden characteristic. Uh, the, a juvenile could make any allegation he wishes in a pretrial motion alleging um, a selective prosecution, and then the Commonwealth would have the opportunity to rebut, and certainly in the opportunity to rebut, if there was, if the juvenile was saying, you only prosecute the, the older complainant, or the older victim, then the prosecutor would have the opportunity to go before the court and explain the rationale for why, the, and to rebut the inference of, um, of discrimination, age discrimination, which um, is not a suspect class. Nevertheless, and the, the remedy, if the court found discrimination, is dismissal of the underlying complaint. It does not mean that the statute itself is unconstitutional. Simply because the statute allows um, for prosecutorial discretion um, and, and 
may encompass acts that the, or may be under prosecuted, um, as one of the amicus briefs <coughs> pointed out, that again does not mean that the statute is unconstitutional. So long as the statute does not infringe on a protected right, it meets a rational basis test, um, is under, clear and understandable by um, ordinary meaning, then the statute survives judicial scrutiny and is on a case-by-case -case basis that a defendant or a juvenile can allege selective prosecution. Um, but don't you need to be careful what you wish for since selective prosecution is very narrowly defined in part because we recognize that prosecutive discretion is generally to be respected. It's not generally defined to focus on prosecutive choice. It's really quite limited. So are you saying that if you were to prosecute one as opposed to another, then the defendant could say that was selective prosecution, not because you only prosecute homosexual acts or not because you only prosecute boys, but because you prosecuted somebody who is weaker or younger or uh, I'm sorry, an equal partner. I'm trying to figure out what, you, what you're asking us to, are you asking us to expand the scope of selective prosecution in order to save the statute? No, Your Honor. I'm, I was merely pointing out that in this case, there were no pretrial motions regarding constitutionality at, of any, at the, these constitutional issues are raised for the first time on appeal. So that was my point, is that these issues could and should be raised at the trial level before they're brought before this court. That being said, if such a motion were raised, um, the Commonwealth's position would be that where age itself is not a suspect class, the Commonwealth would have no difficulty having that motion um, dismissed at the trial level. So the, the, there really is no bound on an age prosecution? No, you're right. I, right. There's I mean, other, other, frankly, than the ballot box, right, for the DA. But there is no, there's no break on what a prosecutor can do in, in charging the eight-year-old or whoever under the statute. I, I, th I think that's, I think I understand what you're saying, Your Honor. I think that that's, that's correct. However, I think that Justice Gans's point that these, um, the prosecutorial decision making is not necessarily amenable to judicial review because these cases are so fact specific. And the fact of the matter is that there are so few of these um, cases that arise in the juvenile courts that this is the kind of case that came before your honors is involving a 12 year old and an eight year old. There are rare except in this sense. You have a 15, two 15 year olds or a 15 year old and a 14 year old and there's, a, uh, there's an indictment for aggravated rape, and the jury comes back with a lesser included offense. Um, so that's not rare. Of statutory rape. Right? They don't find force. They don't, they don't find force. I think in your honor's situation, you might be talking about a, a YO case or in right. superior yeah. court. Um, Correct, but in that, in that instance, you, here we're in juvenile court. Um, we're not talking about youthful offenders, we're not talking about superior court. So I think that that is um, a fair distinction to make. Yeah, I'm just making the point, it's, it, it, sure, it's rare, I've never seen it, where you have even a 16-year-old and a 15-year-old. I'm just saying it's not real when you're dealing with the jury coming back with a lesser included offense. I think, I think that's a, a fair statement, and that's exactly what happened in the underlying case, the juvenile was charged with forcible rape of a child. I think the Commonwealth had um, ample probable cause to charge forcible rape of a child. Um, the force was the age differential. The, um, the juvenile, the victim testified that he was scared. He didn't want to, it hurt. Um, but the jury came back um, not guilty on the forcible rape of a child, but um, guilty or delinquent on the statutory rape. So I think that in, in, in many instances, and in this case, it goes to show the difficulty that um, the prosecutor or that the Commonwealth often does have in um, the subtle instances of force and coercion that are often involved in juvenile cases where it's not, uh, the force is not necessarily obvious, which is why um, the argument that the Commonwealth can simply rely on the forcible rape of a child statute um, is not, a practical solution to, to 
an alleged constitutional violation. Do you have any insight into why the statute retain the words retains the word abuses? I, I don't, Your Honor. Thanks. I don't. I, I, I think it's a um, an artifact from the archaic version of the statute that certainly only included um, females, and that was um, a much younger age mm -hmm. age but limit. The archaic version had under 10 years old. Right. Certainly, this this, this statute is um, over 100 years old. It's been through several. Um, amendments, which is why in the most recent amendment, I think it was in 2008, um, not to the, the most recent amendment was in 2008, and, and then that, um, the 2008 amendment targeted adult offenders in 23A. So I think any suggestion that the legislature did not intend for Section 23 to encompass juvenile offenders um, is belied by both the legislative history of the statute itself, it being um, more recently amended, and by um, decisions of this court and of the appeals court, where although this issue is not addressed head on, certainly um, there have, it's the, the underlying case involves a juvenile charged with statutory rape. Um, and in Bernardo B, it was specifically in a footnote that the um, juvenile below was charging, alleging vagueness, however, the issue was not before the court and the court declined to address it in Bernardo B. So why should we not find that the term abuse of a child is implicit whenever it's an adult having sexual intercourse with a child, but that it need be proven, it would not, it's not implicit, need be proven if you're charging a child with sexual intercourse with another child? Reading the statute in two different ways um, with respect to statutory rape for adults and with children, I think, would lead to um, a slippery slope. That's not the standard for any other. This court hasn't read in any additional elements with respect to other criminal delinquency complaints with, with which juveniles are charged. It would add an element that I think um, the well, element's there. It's not I'm not adding it. It says and abuses a child. It's, it says has sexual intercourse or unnatural sexual intercourse, and then it adds the statute adds the language and abuses a child. Right, so but it's not as if we're adding the language. The language is there. The question is how to interpret that language. The court has interpreted that language to mean two elements with respect to um, adult defendants um, in statutory rape in, st in statutory rape cases. So I would suggest that. Um, di diverging from that precedent in a juvenile case would be um, would be troubling. And additionally, I don't. It, I, are there cases that actually interpret the meaning of abuse of a child in out there um, I, in this statute? In this state, Your Honor. No, in this. I'm trying to understand. Have have we read it out? You're sort of assuming we've read it out. I'm just. Have we expressly read it out in in SJC cases? I don't think it's been expressed. I think that the, the holdings have been that there are two elements of statutory rape. And is that the model jury instructions say that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Finally, Your Honor, with respect to um, notice um, arguments that were made by the juvenile and by some um, Miki, there is no constitutional basis that a juvenile is entitled to notice that his action may be illegal before he may be adjudicated delinquent. Um, it's not the standard in other criminal co complaints. It would be creating an ignorance of the law exception that would create a slippery slope. Um, it's not what this court did in Clint C. It used an objective standard in Clint C in a, assessing the youthful, um, youthful offender um, knowledge that the person would have um, <clears throat> known that, uh, implied knowledge that his conduct constituted an infliction or threat of serious bodily harm. I would suggest that where the court in Clint C used an objective standard here, there's, the, there's no additional need that a juvenile be placed on some sort of notice. The um, mitigating factor, of course, is that here we are in juvenile court where the courts understand that although the juvenile is not absolved from his transgressions, he's not as morally reprehensible as that of an adult. So I'd simply say that assumed lack of notice is not a constitutional basis on which to relieve all juveniles in all circumstances for statutory rape um, of liability. <coughs> okay, thank, thank you. Yours.